Good morning and welcome to an American Conservative's exploration of the inspired Word of God. I'm your host, Ken McClinton. I'm so glad that you're with us this morning. Today, we're looking again into the specificities of Jesus's manifesto, the Sermon on the Mount. We're still in the process of closing out just chapter five. We still have six and seven to do. Uh, and I'm enjoying this. I have, in all my years of study, this is the most intensive it has ever been in terms of the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm glad. I'm glad because I get to see Jesus anew and a greater development of what he expects of us who follow him. This morning, I'm so glad to have you with us. There's some things that you need before we get started. So let me get those things for you. And they're all on your computer. So don't worry, you don't have to go anywhere. The number one tool that we use is the Blue Letter Bible. B-L-U-E-L-E-T-T-E-R-B-I-B-L-E dot O-R-G. Go there, vary your translations, vary your text. You can use them. I use the King James Version because it's as close to the interlinear Bible as I can get. Also, type in online etymology. Why etymology? In the study of his word? Well, it's okay for someone to give a, 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 a certain commentary in today's society about what words mean. But we need to know exactly what words meant in Christ society so that we can apply them to our lives today. Online etymology. And then most importantly, Broadcast Central of the Exceptional Conservative Show.com. During the course of this biblical study, and I want you all to know that I'm not perfect. Okay, so. This is not from on high, I look down in condescension towards you. No, we study his word. And notes are kept in the chat room so that you can catch up if there's some places where you maybe went a little too far one way or didn't go far enough. During the course of our Bible study, there are notes that you can go back to. So this is what we want to do. Let us open up with a word of prayer and then set our hearts and minds and souls to study his word. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day, a day that you have made, and we are glad in it. Lord God, there is nothing perfect in any of us as we come before you this day, except the perfection of knowing your name, knowing your will, knowing your heart. Knowing you allows us to get past what we know about ourselves. Lord Jesus, I ask right now in surrendering to your word and your will this day that you forgive me of all my sins and my transgressions against you. Lord God, that you renew my heart. Only you, by your spirit, can touch my heart and change me. It takes me following your word and your will to mold my life where I show that I am changed. I ask you right now, Father God, for those who are listening because they seek to be healed of the infirmities about them or the addictions besetting them or even the ails that they cannot overcome. Lord Jesus, I refer them to the fact that healing is the children's bread and that they settle their hearts and minds and souls upon you. Lord, those, for those who wish this particular day to come as a skeptic, to come as one who questions even the existence of the one true God, the very living God who spoke into existence their very being. Lord Jesus, I ask you right now to give them the fortitude to listen and to hear and to obey. Lord God, give them the ability to surmise their pride and most importantly Lord God to hear your word and to surrender to your will 
Lord God, for those who come this day, I ask that you scratch our hearts, that you remove the insulation which is worried and deepened and broken and till our soil, Lord God, to make us open to hearing your word. Make us new again in your image. In the matchless and mighty name of Jesus Christ, we all say amen. So what are we doing today, Ken? Oh, well, it's Sunday morning. And I know that many people are out and about on this Sunday morning. They're out and about doing the things which a day of rest would give them. And in fact, many of them, like it unto myself, spoke it into existence uh, virtually many days ago. I, I'm going to do a Bible study on Sunday morning, so I need to. Some said, hey, you know what? I'm going to fix my brakes this morning. There, there's nobody out there. Nobody's bothering me. I, some people said, I'm going to sneak into the office this morning and get that project finished so I can take the day off next Friday. Some said, you know what? I just want to sit quietly. I don't want to be bothered. I want to be left alone. And then still others said, hey, let's get up and let's go to church this morning. People have spoken into existence what they plan to do with their day. And some will maintain that commitment. Some people will actually go to the auto part shop, which opens in about a half hour or so, and they will get the brake pads that they need to fix the brakes on their car. Others were on their way to church might see a sign outside a restaurant that says jazz brunch and say, you know what? It's okay if I miss this Sunday. I'll pick it up next Sunday. And they go in and they have a very nice breakfast or brunch. Still others might say, you know what? I, I, I saw my kid playing football by himself and really there is no greater penalty than to watch a little boy throw a football up in the air to himself to try to catch it to pretend to be both quarterback and wide receiver and i decided you know monday morning is what work is best done i'm going to just put my briefcase in the car i'll be ready for tomorrow and i'm going to throw that football at that little boy Still others will say, you know what? I need to go to the store to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this. I need it. But in every instance, someone is speaking things into an existence. A man can't marry a woman lest he say, I do. A woman can't marry a man unless she says, I do. At least in this culture. There's some cultures that don't require a woman to say anything. Just shut up and be present. You know what you are, your property. But God's will is that we understand the power of our voice. The power of our voice is available in knowing the power of Christ. To know the power of Christ is to know the power of the Holy Spirit. To know the Holy Spirit who points back to Christ is to know the power of the one true living God. How might we know the power of the one true living God? Before we look at the Sermon on the Mount today, as we're just one, actually two episodes away from finishing off the series of chapter five, I wanna bring you to one of the most powerful moments in the history of the Bible. <clears throat> No, it's not the day that you actually bought the King James with the lambskin covered. No, no, that's not it. I want to take you for a moment, before we get into Matthew 5.33, I want to take you to Genesis 1. And you might be saying, well, Ken, hey, that's kind of a, what are you talking about, Genesis 1? 
I, I thought we went over that uh, about women and men being equal. I, I, yeah, but I want to take you back to Genesis one one for a moment. If you just bear with me, if you, I love the fact that when you, we all study together, you bear with me. I want you to understand the power of speech. And today, in our lesson, which is uh, entitled "To Whom I Swear." One voice, one vow, one vote. This week and probably next week, we're going to get into the power of your voice and how your voice extends to the things that you agree to publicly and privately in the name of God. And then how that voice that created that vow becomes a public expression of everything that you say, think, and do, and whom you believe, in whom you believe. I want you to understand that what you do every single day tells me whom you believe in, tells me whom you support tells me whom you speak for. We're going to take a look at that. And for some people who thought that the first three months of this program regarding the Sermon on the Mount were tough, and there have been some episodes that have been very, very tough, I'm going to assure you that today and next week are going to be very, very tough. So much so that you might remember that there were so many who were outlined at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus being at the top and then his disciples being around him uh, and then his followers and then the masses, the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, Pharisees, Sadducees, Pharisees and the uh, Greeks and the Romans and the Arabs. They had assembled around him at the base of the mount. Jesus is speaking to them that they might understand not only the word that their father, Moses, and Abraham gave them, but to understand who gave Moses and Abraham their words. He spoke, and so it was. If you might, I'm going to put this in the chat room, and I want you to understand how powerful this is as we go along. He spoke, and so it was. You speak, and so it is. Do you understand that? And here we go. So he spoke, God spoke, and so it was. You speak, and so it is. In about a month or so, you're going to be speaking very loud and very clear to the rest of the world. And the rest of the world will be able to point back at not only whom, you voted for, whom you made a vow to, and whom you speak for, but to whom you swear. And I want you all to know that at this point, there have been a lot of teachings that people have given and have never dealt with this issue in your church because they don't want you to critically think. There's a difference between doing and saying and believing and but critically thinking yourself through the process. Critically thinking says that there is a A that I must think about and a B which I must compare the A to. 
And if the B doesn't line up with the A, I must reject the B and go with the A. If the word of God is A, and what's happening in the world is B, and you apply B to A, and it doesn't match up with the word, which one of the two must you let go? Thank you. I'm glad that you're with me this morning. You have to let go of the world and go with the will and the word of God. He spoke, and so it was. You speak, and so it is. Let's go now into the scripture. Let's go to Genesis 1-1 for a moment. Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Let me just make that very poignantly clear to those who are following along at home and thought, you know, mom and dad once told me out in the barn that they created the heavens and the earth. No, let's just give real attention to the truth. The truth of the matter is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what we're going to do is even get more distinct about that. Elohim. Strong's H430, entry one. Eloach. Eloach. Second entry. Elohim. Elohim. And the third entry. Eloach. Eloach. Now, a lot of people are asking, says, why do you focus on Elohim or Elohach? Why are you focused on him this particular day? Well, Elohim happens to refer to the plural intensive singular meaning of God, the one true God, the works or special possessions of the one true God, but also someone who is God-like. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's just be very clear. Many of us act in our lives as if we are God ourselves. Uh, we hear the voice of God, and we say we will follow his voice and do his will, but oftentimes his word and his will are completely apart from what we do with our lives. And we find it difficult to understand why God can't get along with what we want to do. So in the instance... With Elohim, you're talking about individuals who believe, based on what they know, that they are God themselves, and they will make judgments. Ah, oh, wait a minute. What are you talking about, kid? That's not what it says there. Well, actually, it does. In the plural of this particular word, you're looking at individuals who happen to be rulers, judges, divine ones, angels, gods. How often have you been referred to in your lifetime as an angel? Oh, Lord, you're just the angel. you just... Not just the heavenly, but the humanly. Not just the divine, but humanity. There are angels. And angels, or angelos, refers to the term messenger. You are a messenger of God, according to Matthew 28, 18. I'm sorry. Yeah, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Let me take you there real quick, and then we're going to go back uh, to our study at hand. I want to take you to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And I know a lot of people are looking back and saying, hey, wait a minute, that's a whole lot of stuff we just getting started with. Yes, we are. So in Matthew 28, 18 it reads and jesus came and what did he do what did he do he spake unto them saying remember that god created the heavens and the earth well you have to ask yourself how did god create the heavens and the earth he did it by speaking jesus came and he spake to them saying all power all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. 
heaven and earth. That means your powers come from him. They are vested in you. But why are they vested in you? Are they not vested in you to do his word and his will? Oh, yes, they are. He's saying to you, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Now, if someone has that kind of power, would you swear by their name? Why it is the only name I would swear to, Matthew 28, 19. Why would we swear by that name? Well, well, the word says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Go means that you are angelos, you are the messenger of God. Go, you are apostolic. In nature, I'm not talking about uh, some divine from on high interpretation, which is re uttered to you as something new and you have codes of new law. No, that's not what we talk. Apostolic simply means that you've been sent. And what have you been sent to do according to Matthew 28 19? To go and to teach and to baptize. Well, we're not supposed to judge people. Well, you are judging the world. How are we judging the world? As those who believe in the way. We're judging the world to see if those have gone to them and have spoken to them of who? Jesus Christ. And are teaching all nations. You will know a nation that's not been taught the word of God. In the, in the way. In the word and in the will. And baptizing individuals. That means that people are dying to their sins and publicly expressing Christ to the world. And here it is. A lot of people focus on the name. The bottom line is the one true God in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you would just focus on doing the verbal part and not worrying about the uh, prepositional phrase here. Okay. You will be just fine. You will be just fine. And I want you to also take a look finally. Matthew 28, 20. Since you are apostolic in the being sent and you've been sent not to observe, sit there and ponder as the Greeks did uh, at Mars Hill, but to actually observe them as judges of what they are not doing, and then go teach them what Jesus said to do, no matter the repercussion that may come your way. I have commanded you well, actually, Matthew 28, 20 says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You shall judge them. You shall rule. And how shall you judge and rule? Not as an oppressor, but as a liberator. You will look at what they've been taught, see the error of their ways, teach them what Jesus taught you, and then you go. And what confidence do you have? What, whom can you swear by that this will work? Jesus gives you in finality exactly whom you can have your confidence in. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back. And we're going to take a look at Genesis 1-1, God speaking into existence all life, including you. And we're going to start taking a very heavy toll on the soul. Because choices are going to be made in our lives, and we want them to be right choices. To whom I swear, one voice, one vow, one vote. Matthew 5:37. but let your communication be... Yea, yea, nay, nay, 
for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. This is a very touchy subject. It's a love story like no other. From God's heart to yours. And for 30 years, it's been at the heart of every book, Bible, CD, gift, and resource from ChristianBook.com. Over 500,000 products, always at the very best value. ChristianBook.com. Everything Christian. Because it's our story, too. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you back to an American conservative's exploration of the inspired Word of God. I'm your host, Kevin McClenchon. So glad to have you here with us today. We're taking a look at Matthew 5 uh, and the 37th verse. But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. There are some choices that we'll be making in the future for this particular country. And there are other countries around the world that listen to this program, and they must make decisions too. But often our decisions are made based on popular opinion. What is best for us? Self-interest. And for some of us, what's best for our community or our neighborhood? And for some of us, what is best for society? And for some of us, what is best for the nation? They're differing pots. But in all of those particular pots, there is a requirement of judgment. There is a requirement that you're ruling. And I'm not speaking in an oppressive state, but are you a liberator? Are you one who seeks to free men? Or are you those who seek to oppress men? God is actually giving you an opportunity to show the world whom you swear by. Really? Not whom you swear in, but whom you swear by. And as we were taking a look at Matthew 9, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and as well, Genesis 1, 1, we're taking a look at whom God has the power vested in that will satisfy your swear. Now, when I speak of swearing, I'm not referring to cursing. I'm not referring to the fact that there's some Christians that make drunken sailors look virginal. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is whom I swear by, I swear in, and I swear to. There's a power vested in you by Christ. God gave that power to you at Calvary. And in giving you that power has also committed to you a responsibility to show the world whom you swear by one voice, one vow, one vote. Trust me, you're going to be listening over the next two weeks. There's a lot of information to give. I want you to have it so that you make the right choices, not just for election, and not just for your personal family life, but what's good for the nation, for society, for your community, for your neighborhood, for you, the individual, and family. So let's go back to Genesis 1-1 for a moment. In Genesis 1-1, we were talking about Elohim, you know, Elohek, and God is assuredly chosen by himself to be the creator of heaven and earth. Now, I mean that all in jest to you and me because we didn't choose him. He chose himself. God, God created the heavens of the earth, heaven and earth. Now, Genesis 1 verse 2 says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Holy Spirit is right there at the beginning. God, the Father, is right there at the beginning. 
how do we know that the word is right there at the beginning? Now, we can always go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 and 15. But let's see where we find the word at the beginning of all history. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. And God said, let there be light and there was light yes ladies and gentlemen god spoke and it came to pass light now i want to deal with light for just one moment because we dealt with that just a few weeks ago and I, this is going to be a refresher for a lot of folk when you take a look at that particular word and you look at uh h216 of strong's the lexicon that we use. Strong's H216, Ord, Ord. Ord, Ord. What does that mean? Well, it's very simple in a very complex way. Let me give you all of the lights that are mentioned throughout the scriptures in terms of references to all of this. It's a lot, so bear with us. You have the light of day. I have the light of day right now. Look at that sunshine coming through. Light of heavenly luminaries. The sun, the moon, the stars. We watched uh, as we were driving last night, my wife and I, and she kept pointing to the stars in the sky. The lights. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, indeed. We also talk about daybreak and dawn and morning light. We talk about daylight, of course. And when that pesky storm comes our way, the lightning in the storm, which shakes us with fear. The light of a lamp that we use to guide our direction. The light of life in whom we believe and know the truth. Then you have the light of prosperity. And boy, everything becomes light when you're prosperous. Uh, well, most things. The light of instruction. As we study his word and show his truth, we believe in what he says, and then we do. Light of face. Nothing makes the world better than a smile. And then Jehovah as Israel's light. God gave the smallest group of people the greatest hope, and today they are a great nation. Amidst over 40 enemies surrounding them, hoping to pound them into the Mediterranean Sea amazing how great God is. Would the Jew swear? Well, actually they would. And we're going to get into that in just one moment. That is the light. God is the light. In Genesis 1 verse 4, Verse 3, God spoke, and it came to pass. You speak, and it is. He spoke, and it was. Genesis 1, 4. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Genesis 1, 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. The light spent one whole day. The light. Light is very important. Light leads us and guides us. It brightens our way. But what can does this have to do with an election? What does this have to do with one voice, one vow, one vote? What does this have to do with whom we swear to? Well, let's take that now 
in terms of question and let's go in terms of answer let's go to Matthew chapter 5 verse Thirty-eight. There we go. Bingo. We have to do chapter five, verse thirty-eight. It came up on the screen. I apologize for the delay. And it reads, "Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth." Well. <clears throat> Have you heard that before? Yeah. You know, I, I grew up also as scholarly and athletic as I look. I grew up actually uh, in neighborhoods that were pretty tough uh, over in Southeast Washington, D.C. And the feeling in the community was this. If you do me wrong, I'm going to do you even more wrong. And if you retaliate, I'm going to retaliate right back. And if you have one person in a fight amongst my family, the brothers will come out and we will fight you. And if you bring your sisters to the fight, our sisters will come out and we will fight you. And and if you broke the windshield of my car, I'm going to tear up the tires on your car. And if you come back and put sugar in my gas tank, I'm going to take everything off your car, dismantle it, and sell it. An eye for an eye, a two for a two. I want to ask you real quick in terms of your particular history in faith do you still subscribe to an eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth it is retaliation it is the law of retaliation and the principle is that a person who has injured another person is to be penalized to a similar degree or in certain interpretation the victim receives the estimated value of the loss we're talking about here retaliation let me put that in the chat roll for those who are following along at home god jesus christ on the sermon on the mount has turned away from divorce and we took three weeks on that one, to the law of retaliation. How do you deal with your enemy? Do you love your friends more than you love your enemy? Jesus is about to turn your nature around. The law of retaliation. Let us take a look in the online etymology of what it means for retaliation. Kim, what does that got to do with politics? There's no retaliation in politics. Oh, really? Oh, really? Sometimes we have forgotten the purposes for why we represent people. It really means in Latin to pay back. The big payback. Uh, retaliation comes from the Latin retaliare, which means payback in kind. Uh, and exaction of payment in kind. Yeah. And it gets into what's good and what's evil, whether you're Jew or Greek, Arab or European, African or Asian, Black Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter. What is payback in kind? What do you pay back? Well, Ken, what does that have to do with one voice? One? It's all coming together. Relax, relax. 
So Jesus goes on in this particular scripture and he says, well, actually that's part of the journey. Let's go back to Matthew 5.33 regarding oaths and I do apologize. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Well, what does retaliation have to do with, with the whole concept, Ken? You swear to do his word and his will. In dealing with your enemies, and we're going to deal with that in the next couple of weeks or so. Dealing with your enemies. How do you contrive that you're doing his word and his will if you attack your enemies in such a fashion where retaliation becomes uh, justified at every leisure and every degree? Eventually, you're going to end up going to court. Some people end up going into a pine box in terms of retaliation. However, even in a courtroom, there is a request that you swear to something. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 33, again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. God never asked you to swear by yourself. In fact, let's take a look at that particular word. Strong's G, 1964. We're going to take a look at Strong's G, 1964. And get that in there. Forgive me. Strong's G, 1964. Epiotikeo. Epiotikeo. That means to forswear thyself, to swear by thyself. It also, in the guise of God, was when you swear by yourself, uh, you swear falsely. Uh, let me give you the term for swearing falsely. You lie. No one likes to be called a liar, but the truth of the matter is, Jesus says, when you swear by yourself and not by me to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, you lie. You have only a self-interest, not a God interest in all of this. And the God interest is that I am troubled by my conscience to be a witness and testimony, not just of myself, but of God's work in me. God opened my eyes in the night to see someone breaking into my neighbor's house. I didn't just go right back to bed and say, that's my neighbor's problem. What I did was I called 911 to make certain that the police came. And I gave a report to the police of what I saw. And when I am required to go to court, I will swear by his name that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. When we take a look at Matthew 5:34. He says, but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. Listen to what he's saying. He's not telling you in all sincerity not to swear. Because swearing is a part of acknowledging a witness through natural law, that there was someone greater than myself that I accord my truth. What he is telling you is swearing is so vital, so sincere, 
and swearing, you can take a look at Strong's G3660. Strong's G3660. Strong's G3660. I'm new old. I'm new old. And looking at that particular term, God says to affirm, to promise, to threaten with an oath puts both heaven and earth, the power of heaven and earth in your hands at once. In swearing to call a person or a thing as a witness to invoke to swear by. I want y'all to understand your promises to your baby that you're going to pick them up on the weekend and take them to, to lunch and you don't do it breaks faith. I, I wish I had a glass I could throw from the top floor of my home to the bomb so that you can hear the heartbreak of someone when a swearing is made, a promise is made, an affirmation is made, even a threat is made to be witnessed by God. And then it's broken. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 35, it is written, don't also, and in summary, let me just say that he doesn't want you swearing by the earth. So here it goes, Matthew 5, 35, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do you understand? Jesus is saying to you right here, which goes back to why divorce was so important. Your promise to him is heaven and earth. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God says, when you promise something when you make one voice one vow one vote you are according to heaven and earth which are the possessions of the living god matthew 537 536 forgive me neither shall thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. Here it is, people. There are lots of people that say, well, I don't want to swear on the Bible. I don't want to swear to God. You know, I swear to myself. God says you're a fool. When did you make the heavens and the earth? Does your power create gray hair no children have that power no not really but you 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 really can't promise when you wake up in the morning first and foremost you can't promise waking up in the morning but secondly you can't promise what you're going to do thereafter you really can't you have to, if it's God's will, this is what I plan on doing today. If it's by his word, I want to do this today. You really have to put your faith and confidence completely in God. Because to swear by you is to swear by a fool. And to swear by a fool doesn't make common sense. Matthew 5, 37. Matthew 5, 37. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Jesus says that when you say you're going to do something, 
when you're going to say something and you don't, when you follow through, which is how we know that all men have fallen short of the glory of God. The only thing that's going to come of that is evil. And you can check that out at G4190 of the Strong's Lexicon. Strong's G4190. Paneras. Paneras. Well, what does it mean by Paneras? Paneras. Nothing good comes of promises that are broken. Nothing good comes of affirmations to oneself or to others or even to God and you fall short of them. What he says to you is, well, let's look at the physical thing first and then we'll look at the ethical and the overall. In the physical sense, if you lie to certain people, uh, disease and blindness and torture and other things will come your way. In the physical sense, someone may not have the type of patience that you have and they will do an evil thing to you in the ethical ethical sense of it all when you don't keep your promises you have committed an evil people will see you as wicked or bad so in a sense the overall part of this is that by not keeping your promises faithfully you're really doing a bad thing now i'm not judging you who's judging you jesus is jesus is saying to you and to me and i'm telling you this really hurts today as we get into one voice one vow one vote to whom i swear when i swear by god and i break that promise i break his heart I break other people's heart, but my heart's broken too. My reputation's torn asunder. I have to fight hard to get that back. It's not given to me, it's earned. But also, <clears throat> let's look at the handy dandy daily part of this. When we swear and break our promises, well, there are some other things that take place as well. we have to work harder to make up for our broken promises we are going to be harassed my wife loves me but if i promise her i'm going to do something and i fall through she would tell me a few weeks later you know what you, you fell through and you broke my heart I find it hard to trust you now so i'm going to start doing stuff myself remember we talked about divorce last week and that the role of marriage is about reverencing the father in the house. You reverence the father by making a promise that you're going to love the daughter so much you're going to take the daughter out of his house and make children that you will father and take care of as he has done so in his house. Wow. And then you break that promise. And then they can't find you. Your labors will be hard. Toil and pain and struggle come your way. For those brothers who decide to have children out of wedlock and walk out and do their own will, well, they'll catch you up on the Social Security block and they will say to you, you know, you need to make a payment to us. So your money is not yours anymore. It causes pain and trouble. The child who goes through divorce are always troubled by the fact that maybe they were responsible for the broken promises of their parents. On the job, you promise that you're going to get something done, the project done, and it doesn't get done in a timely manner. But when you turn it in, you think that they should throw you a parade. Well, firing might come from that. Uh, with the disappointment of people around you in terms of your leadership, your skills, your abilities, overwhelming. 
I want you to understand something as we close, <clears throat> which is why we're looking at one voice, one vow, one vote, to whom I swear this is part one, next week will be part two. <clears throat> when you go into that booth on November the 8th, you're swearing to God that you have chosen the person of the options given who will best represent you, the sovereign. You, the person who's in charge of judging and ruling here on earth. <clears throat> that you have looked at the individual's character, <clears throat> you have looked at their platform, you have looked at what they believe in and their accomplishments. And you're making them your agent, which makes them an agent of your representation of God in the earth. And you're going to choose the one, not on feelings, but on faith. You're making a promise to God that the person that you are choosing to labor for you will best represent him in the earth. You swear when you go into that booth. You swear with your voice, with a commitment called a vow. You do make a vow when you look at the platform. You choose between parties. They have platforms and you must apply the platform to the word of God. And if their platform doesn't match up with the word of God, then you have to let go of their platform and go with the word. With one voice, with one vow, with one vote, you're swearing something. And when you swear it, you're making a promise to God in heaven and in earth When that promise is broken, and when it falters, evil is done, and bad things will happen. Ask the 70 million children who have died in America since Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade in 1972. And tell me how that platform lines up with his word. And as the sovereign, are you making a promise to God to put people in to destroy his word? If so, you got to let that go. We'll see you next week for part two. It's a love story like no other, from God's heart to yours. And for 30 years, it's been at the heart of every book, Bible, CD, gift, and resource from ChristianBook.com. Over 500,000 products, always at the very best value. ChristianBook.com, everything Christian, because it's our story too.